If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us acclaim the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us joyfully sing psalms to him. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord who made us, for he is our God, and we are the people he shepherds, the flock he guides. If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Church, would you stand with me and let's uh, pray this morning. Lord, we come before you this morning as your church, one body knit together by the love of your Holy Spirit. We take the burdens and the disorders of our lives right now and we give them all to you, asking for peace and for transformation. So search our hearts, search our minds now as we worship you and as we praise your name. Let us draw close to you through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stay standing and let's sing our first hymn today, hymn number one. Praise to the Lord, hymn number one.
Happy Sabbath, family. Wow, we are a family, aren't we? Let me try that one more time. Happy Sabbath, church family. Oh, that sounds so much more like you're connected and you're being family today. What a privilege it is for us today to have our very first church family picnic for the new year. Isn't that wonderful? It's going to be right after church today in the Glen Oaks Park. Now, this is for all families, whether you are a family of one or 21. I'm inviting you, we're inviting you, our church is inviting you to come bring your lunch. I hope you brought it. If you didn't bring it, we'll work with you and we'll share, I promise. Bring your lunch over to the, the, to the Glen Oaks Park right after church service today and let's fellowship together. And we're going to share some great time together, not just eat. We're going to talk and we're going to have some fun. We're going to have a few games and we're going to share a couple of tips to help us build strong families. Okay. So I want to see everybody there. There's plenty of room over at the Glen Oaks Park today after church. I also want to uh, remind you that next Sabbath, Sabbath school will have an interesting twist. We're starting something brand new. We're going to start with a courtyard breakfast. How many of you know where the courtyard is? Everybody. Hmm? That's why everybody is with their hands up, right? Everybody knows where the courtyard is, right? So next Sabbath, we're going to have a courtyard breakfast. And right over there in the courtyard, you'll be able to come and fellowship. It's going to start at 9 a.m. in the morning. Have your breakfast here with us. Isn't that exciting that the church is inviting you to have breakfast? And then we'll go right into our Sabbath school lesson. I'm excited about that. We want to see everyone here next Sabbath for our Sabbath school breakfast in the courtyard. And then next Sabbath, we also have Family Sabbath. And our service is going to be a bit different on Family Sabbath. It's going to be the first of every um, month. We, the first Sabbath of every month, it's a new tradition we've began here at the Vallejo Drive Seventh-day Adventist Church, that on the first Sabbath of every month, uh, all of us, adults, young adults, youth, and children, will all worship together and so there'll be no children's church to next Sabbath. And I want to make sure all of you get to come and attend. The service is going to be a little bit different, a little bit more blended with some more contemporary music. And I promise you're going to really, really love it. Today, we want to just uh, mention with sadness two losses that we've had in our family. And we pray for the Wilcox family as they mourn the loss of their father and grandfather, Ronald Wilcox, this past Sabbath at the age of 88, he will be greatly missed. Also, with sadness, we announced the passing of Ann Pillar McClintock, wife of Jim McClintock, who uh, was involved in singing uh, for 15 years as a bass with the King's Herald's Quartet on the Voice of Prophecy. Some of you remember him singing. The memorial service for Anne will be held Saturday, February the 3rd at 4 p.m. And so we want to invite anyone who wants to attend there. The reception will follow at the uh, Carmelo, Carmelo SDA Church uh, next Sabbath. Today, we want to invite our young children to come forward for the children's story. And while they're doing that, I invite you, church family, just reach across and greet somebody here today. Make sure you try and greet someone maybe that you don't know, that you've never met before, so that we can all be included in the family of God today in our church. God bless you. Well, good morning, boys and girls. How's your new year going so far? Can you believe that the first month is almost over? And you're halfway through whatever grade you're in? I'm going to ask you a question this morning. What do you want to be 
when you grow up? I know everybody asks you that all the time. Um, an engineering. He wants to be in, in engineering. I want to be a nuclear engineer. I want to be a veterinarian. I want to be an engineer. Anybody, anybody else? I want to be an engineer. We have some smart ones here. Anybody else? Well, where do you think you're going to learn these things? Let's see. If you want to be an engineer, do you think that you would go to a carpenter school? No, why not? Because they don't know how to do engineering, do they? Wow, if you want to be a veterinarian, do you think that you would go to accounting school? Why not? Because they're not taking care of animals, they're working with numbers. Wow, let's see. Does anybody want to be a doctor? Some girls do. I like it. Well, if you want to be a doctor, shall you go to, hmm. A doctor school. A doctor school. Med school. If you want to be something, you have to go and talk to the people who know how to do that. And they will teach you what you need to know. Now, I want to ask you a question. What if you want to know all about God and Jesus? Where are you going to go? To church. To church. That's a great place to learn about God. What if you can't have access to a church right then? You look at the Bible. We've taught them well. You look in this book. It comes in all different colors and covers, but it's the same book. What does it say? The Holy Bible. We can learn about Jesus and God from the Holy Bible. What if we don't have a Bible? You buy one. Some people can't buy one. No, that's a good Good answer, but some people don't have one and they don't have the money to buy one. You just know. Well, maybe somebody has to teach you, or maybe you can learn about God by praying to him, right? By singing. Singing some Christian songs. Looking online. Well, that's this generation, right? Well, you can pray to learn about Jesus. You can go online, you can look in the Bible. Wow, there's a lot of different ways to learn about Jesus. Now, in the Bible, there's a story about Jesus, and he hadn't really been out preaching very much. But when the people heard him talking, he didn't say, well, my Bible says this and this and this. He said, I said. So he spoke as one who had authority. So you have to go to that person who knows your subject in order to learn about it. So I want you to maybe take your Bible, if you have one at home, and see if you can learn something about Jesus this week. Okay? There is Children's Church, so try to walk quietly to Children's Church, ages 4 to 12. Thanks for listening. The offering this Sabbath is for religious liberty, and the loose offerings today are for the church budget. We ask that you to continue uh, to support our church for your faithfulness is needed. As the deacons come forward, um, I am reflecting three weeks ago, I received the most amazing gift you could ever imagine from my bank. Earlier that day, my office manager had gone to deposit the insurance checks we received for around $10,000.
Imagine my sheer delight when I saw the deposit slip. I guess the bank teller saw that we needed the money, so she put down not ten thousand dollars, but one million dollars. What a reward for being a faithful tithe payer! <laughs> the windows of heaven, God kept His promise. They just opened up. Immediately, I thought of going to the bank, withdrawing the funds at once, then dropping by Vallejo Drive Church to hand Pastor Papendick the tithe and also a second tithe for the church budget. And then jumping on a plane with Yolanda to Tahiti or Timbuktu, just getting off the grid so no one would find us. So I called up my banker, and after telling her what I was going to take, I was going to take them all to dinner for their kindness to say thanks. And then I told her of the mistake the teller had made, and we all had a good laugh, and I inside had a good cry. <laughs> Two days later, one of our patients. Dropped by our office and gave everyone in our office each a lottery ticket. Now I've I've never bought a lottery ticket in my life, and I never will. But I took the ticket after I didn't buy. <laughs> a week later, I asked my office manager to to. I had no idea how, even what to do, so I told her, "What do you do with this ticket?" And then, sure enough, it wasn't worth anything. In Luke sixteen ten, Jesus says. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. God has invited us to participate in kingdom building by being faithful, not waiting for your lucky day or for that bonus or for some relative to die and leave you in their will. While some churches depend on bingos and festivals and fairs and games of chance to support their work. God's church depends on your faithfulness. I invite us all to be faithful to the Lord. The deacons will now wait upon us for a tithe and offering. <clears throat>
Father, we join the psalmist when he declared in Psalm 89, 1, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Thank you for being a faithful God to us. And now accept our offerings and make us, we pray, Lord, faithful to you even unto death. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. any special prayer requests or needs, please come to the front at this time as we can pray in you while we sing hymn number 671 as we come to you in prayer.
If you are able, please kneel for prayer. Give a Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to give thanks for the many blessings that you have showered us, for the guidance, protection, grace, and mercy that comes unfailingly each day. We are aware that these gifts are underserving most of the time, but your love for us overshadows our sinfulness. You give it to us anyway. Thank you for the gift of Sabbath, a wonderful reminder to rest our weary body and soul as we give glory to your name, our Creator. We are gathered here this morning, some of us joyful for the events that have come about as planned, or even for the little things and big unexpected circum unexpected circumstances that made us smile the past week, that reminded us that we are here for a purpose when we, and we are grateful for this. Some of us are grieving, lost, looking and waiting for an answer. As we wait, dear Lord, we ask that you sustain us with your strength and su supply us with divine wisdom. One thing is for sure, and we cling to this. You always keep your promises, your plan is always good, and it is always at work. It is beyond our grasp and beyond our human intelligence to understand the plan you have for us. We trust your timing, and it is always right. Forgive us for being short-sighted in times like this. Forgive us for failing to see the big picture and failing to be excited. Remind us that it is through testing and through perseverance that a Christ-like character is formed. Forgive us for forgetting that it is about you and not about us. You are the same and you never waver. Dear Father, be with our church on ongoing search for our senior pastor. Send us the right fit. Prepare the right person for us as you work in us as well. I also pray that you will be with Pastor Luke as he delivers his word. May your presence be in the midst of us. Enlighten us and teach us our and touch our hearts, that our character and behavior will be changed for good as we step out of your house today. Thank you for the delight you find in us. This we pray in your precious holy name. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be taken from the book of Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. And I'll be reading from the English Standard Version, and you may follow along with the scripture reading on the screen. And it reads, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding regions of Galilee. May the Lord bless the reading and the hearing and the doing of his holy word. Amen.
I've uh, called today's message because I said so. There's something so authoritative about that phrase, isn't there? Because I said so. I remember when I was a kid and I had all these rules imposed on me by my parents. Why can't I touch this? Why can't I eat that? Why can't I stay up until midnight? And I remember questioning my mum and my dad, saying, why not, why not, why not? And I know that whenever my dad said, because I said so, I just knew that that was immediately the end of the discussion. See, my dad had this unquestionable authority that I just knew that I needed to accept. And so our scripture today tells us about the ultimate authority, someone with far more authority than my dad or your dad or anyone else. And as we're going to see, remarkable things happen when Jesus speaks. Why? Simply because he says so. So before we get into our gospel text that Yolanda just read for us, thanks very much, I want us to look at another text which I think will provide some of the backdrop for the sermon today. So you're welcome to turn to this uh, part of the Bible if you want, or the words will be on the screens either side of me. The first text we, I want us to look at is from Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18. Deuteronomy 18, starting in verse 15. This is Moses talking, and he says, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God or see this great fire anymore, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers and I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. Now let's be honest, I have to admit, I don't spend much time reading Deuteronomy, right? It's one of those books of the Bible that we're not as familiar with. It's kind of obscure, a little bit abstract, a little bit weird, right? But where we would tend to just like brush over this passage and just, you know, flip through the pages, I can tell you this passage is very, very important for Jewish people. Let me just tell you about the context here, what's going on in this passage. So Moses is nearing the end of his career, nearing the end of his life, and he's giving the Israelites some final instructions just before they enter into the promised land. And as we read there, he promises that God is going to raise up another prophet after him, a very special prophet that they will need to listen to very carefully. Now, why is this kind of surprising? Well, for Jews, Moses is like the quintessential prophet. Moses is the prophet, the guy that all the Jews would proudly refer back to. You see, and, and every future prophet, all of their credentials were always measured against Moses. And if you were a rabbi and a teacher, and you wanted to get credibility with followers, if you wanted people to listen to you and become your students, you would always try and trace your teachers back to Moses. You know, if I wanted to be a rabbi, I would say to people, you know, well, I was taught by this rabbi, and he was taught by this rabbi, and he was taught by this rabbi, and so on, until you reach right back to Moses. Yeah, we know there were other prophets. There was, you know, Elisha, Elijah, Isaiah, many others. But Moses, right? Moses was the guy that every serious teacher wanted to be connected to. So it's unusual then that Moses says what he does here. Moses doesn't say, just follow my instructions forever. Moses says, someone more important than me is going to come along. A prophet will arise, he says, who won't just be a spokesperson for God, but someone who will speak, someone who will embody the actual word of God himself. 
And so I think it's important that with that text from Deuteronomy as our backdrop now, our gospel passage makes a lot more sense and it packs a far more powerful punch. So if you don't have to, but if you want to have the gospel passage at your side, you can turn to it now. Again, it's, in, it's Mark chapter 1, verse 21 to 28. If you want to have that on your Bibles or your phones, I invite you to as we look into, uh, into, into that in a bit more detail. And so what I want to say at the beginning is like, remember that Mark chapter 1, right? This is the very beginning of the gospel and Mark is the first gospel that was written. So here we really have Jesus right at the very, very beginning of his ministry. Jesus is fresh on the scene and Mark wants to show us just what kind of teacher Jesus really is. And so as we see there, Jesus goes to the synagogue on the Sabbath and he starts teaching. Maybe he's teaching Sabbath school. Maybe he's doing the, the main sermon of the day. Maybe he's running a small group. Maybe he's doing an afternoon seminar. We don't know. But there's something, something about Jesus' teaching that compels people to say, what is this? Here is a new authority that I've never seen before. You know, I like listening to Pastor Mark. I like listening to Peter and Shane, sometimes even to Luke. But this guy, this guy, Jesus, is something else. And maybe you think, well, what about the scribes? Weren't the scribes the best teachers that Israel had to offer? Well, yeah, they were. And the scribes were often administrative secretaries, or the scribes were, they were the best interpreters of the Bible. Some of the scribes were even lawyers, very smart people, the intellectual elites of society. And many of those scribes could, like I was saying before, many of those scribes would get credibility by tracing their teachers all the way back to Moses. But we're told that Jesus, Jesus doesn't teach like the scribes. Jesus teaches with a different authority. Now, interestingly, and I didn't know this before, but the Greek translation of this word authority in Mark chapter 1 is exousia. What does exousia mean? Well, ousia means substance, okay? And ex means out of. Isn't that an interesting and really powerful way of putting it? Jesus teaches, Mark says, out of his own substance. Mysteriously, Jesus is the very own source of his teaching. Does that make sense? See, every other prophet, even Moses himself, what would they do? Well, they would hear a message from God, and then they would pass it on, right? But it was always in a kind of second-hand way. A bit like if you've played that game telephone, right? You pass the message around, but you're always telling it to someone second-hand. But when Jesus speaks, you're listening to the voice of God himself. Now, because I always think in musical terms, and I think, Audrey, you have a, a slide to put up there, one of my favorite guitar players, uh, Jimi Hendrix, have you heard of him? Well, let me give you this little analogy. This is how I think about this. Now, right, I, I could pick up a guitar right now, and I could try my best to play you a Jimi Hendrix guitar solo. And not to boast, but I think I could do a pretty okay job of it. And how could I do that? Well, because I've watched some guy on YouTube, and he's watched another guy on YouTube, and that guy read a book about guitar players, and so on, and on, and on, and on. And we could trace the teaching of that guitar solo right back to Jimi Hendrix, couldn't we? But here's the thing. Even if I played that solo note for note with no mistakes, you wouldn't be satisfied, would you? It wouldn't be good enough. It wouldn't be the real thing. It's not what you want. It would be secondhand. What you want to see, really, if you could, is Jimi Hendrix in his own substance, standing here in front of you, playing that guitar solo. See, the scribes and the prophets were masterful teachers. 
but Jesus, he was the real deal. That is why it's not good enough just to say that Jesus is one teacher among many. Jesus is not just another Confucius or Muhammad or Dalai Lama. Jesus is not even the best teacher. No, the claim of the Gospels is far bigger than that. That in Jesus is the substance of God himself. That's why we say Christ is God's word in flesh, incarnate, right? Okay, well maybe you're thinking so far this is all theory, right? This is all fine. It's easy to say that Jesus has this new authority, whatever. But is it actually backed up by anything? Well, I find this interesting. You know, specifically Mark's gospel, Mark doesn't really tell us much at all about, about the content of Jesus' teachings, the things that he was actually saying. You know, you think of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, and you get the Sermon on the Plain in the Gospel of Luke, and where those guys spend a few chapters talking about, they expound on Jesus' teachings about everything, anger, lust, divorce, oaths, giving to the poor, all of that detail about the teachings. In the Gospel of Mark, you get none of that. See, for Mark, it is the effectiveness of Jesus' teaching that really matters. And this automatically makes me think of my wife and her favorite love language. You know those five love languages? Her favorite love language is acts of service. She's not nearly as interested in the content of my words as their actualization. See, it's no good for me to say, yeah, I've really, really been thinking about putting up that shelf. And I've really been thinking about taking, up, uh, taking out the trash. And I've got some really interesting things to tell you about shelves and trash. No, she doesn't care about any of that. She says, I want to see you do it. Right? She's not interested in the content of my, of my thoughts about shelves and trash. And I think in exactly the same way, Mark, Mark's not nearly as interested in the content of Jesus' teachings as seeing his authority in action. What does it look like for this one who speaks out of his own substance? What does it look like for him to use that authority? In the second half of the reading, Mark tells us, doesn't it? A man possessed by a demon comes up to Jesus and shouts, What have you got to do with me, Jesus of Nazareth? But Jesus rebukes him and says, Demon, shut up and get out. And the demon shuts up and comes right out. Now, in the ancient world, getting rid of a demon took time and effort. Exorcisms involved complicated rituals, all this obscure equipment, and at least it involved some kind of physical contact with the infected host, right? Not with Jesus. Jesus simply says, get out, and the demon comes out. Who had ever seen such power? Elisha couldn't do that. Elijah couldn't do that. Heck, even, even Moses couldn't do that. But Jesus teaches with a new authority, an authority based not only on words, but an authority accompanied with effective divine power. Demons disappear because he says so. So maybe some of you are sitting here and thinking, well, I don't really need to know this. I mean, this isn't really relevant for my life. Yeah, I get it. Jesus has this authority, but I don't have any demons in my life. I can tell you that, yes, you do. We all do. See, another way of talking about demons is by calling them unclean spirits, a bit like Mark does here, right? 
calling demons unclean spirits. And as you know from your reading of the Old Testament, what does it mean for something to be unclean? Well, when something is unclean, it's the opposite of holy, right? So where holy means complete and perfect and in order, unclean means incomplete, imperfect, disordered. And I don't, don't, don't tell me that all of your lives are perfectly complete and in order, because we just know that's not true, right? So you may not have literal demons, but your demons are the areas of your life that are incomplete, imperfect, and disordered. Your demons are your brokenness, your shame, your guilt, your loneliness, your anxiety, your low opinion about yourself, your sin, your addiction, your bad habits, things in your life that aren't the way they should be. Basically, your demons are the messed up and disordered parts of your life. Uh, our last scripture I want to look at is from Corinthians. And in this passage, Paul is talking to his church members in Corinth, and, about, and he's talking about having disordered anxiety. So in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 32 to 34, Paul says, Brothers and sisters, I should like you to be free of anxieties. An unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But a married man is anxious about the things of the world, how he may please his wife, and he is divided. An unmarried woman or a virgin is anxious about the things of the Lord, so that she may be holy in both body and spirit. A married woman, on the other hand, is anxious about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And that might seem unrelated at the moment, but I think there's a connection here. Well, first, don't misunderstand what Paul is saying here. Paul's not saying that marriage is bad or anything like that. But what he's saying is, when we only worry about worldly things, right, like how successful we are, how much money we make, even just how to please our spouse, that's what he's talking about here. When we're only worried about that stuff, we stop worrying about our relationship with God. And that's a very subtle example of a disordered anxiety. But when your worldly anxieties are held relative to God, then all of your other anxieties just kind of naturally start to sort themselves out. If Christ is your ultimate authority, I can guarantee you a well-ordered life will naturally follow from that. And we don't have the, the final verse on the screen here, but right afterwards, Paul sums up that point in verse 35 and says, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So disorder in your life can be hard to spot. And the reason why is because a lot of things aren't bad in and of themselves, but it's only when they become disordered. I think of the obvious example is something like soil, right? Soil is good and necessary when it's in a field, but soil in your house is dirt, right? It's about having things in their right place. Eating and drinking is good, but when it's disordered, it destroys your body. Sex is good, but when it's disordered, it becomes pornography, lust, adultery. Work is good, but when it's disordered, it becomes self-reliance and greed. Self-respect is good, but when it's disordered, it becomes arrogance and pride. So I really want you guys to ask yourselves and just hold this thought in your, in your mind right now. What are the 
disordered parts of your life. We all have them. Hold them in your mind's eye right now. What are the disordered parts of your life? Well, the beginning of Mark's gospel tells us some very good news. That a new teacher has arrived and he comes with a new authority, an authority higher than Moses or anyone else. An authority that is not only words, but words that contain effective power. Power to bring order out of chaos. So I want to just encourage you today and remind you all that Christ has the ultimate authority over all of your disorders. Because when he commands the unclean spirits, they obey him because he says so. So friends, just remember, listen to Jesus, submit to his authority, and he will rid you of your demons and bring order back into your life. Amen. And I want to invite you now. If you want to give your whole life completely to God, and if you want to submit everything you have and everything you are to Jesus, I invite you now to stand and sing with my friends here, Peter and Nick. Let's sing Take My Life, hymn number 330, Take My Life. the highest authority and you rule not just with words but with words and power we invite you to take our lives take our lives and shape them according to your will may Christ cast out all the uncleanness and bring order to our disorder Lord may we leave this place eager to share that good news with a world that needs it amen <laughs>